This is Join Us in France, episode 370, 370. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Life in France, lovely places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy. But today, I will not update you on news related to travel during the pandemic, because I'm recording this 12 days early, and things change way too fast for that. One thing to note is that our Prime Minister, Mr. Jean Castex has already announced new measures to continue squeezing the unvaccinated that will be debated in the French Assembly and Senate in early January. And I'll tell you more about that after the interview. Today, I bring you a conversation with my friend Elise Riven of Toulouse Guided Walks about the best Gallo Roman sites in France. Romans, they left a big mark on France. The question we'll tackle today is, where should you go to see the most amazing Roman ruins in France? The French expression of the week, <laughs> avoir le cul brodé or avoir le cul brodé de nouilles. <laughs> Not a bad thing to have in the new year, my friends. I will explain after my chat with Elise. This podcast is supported by donors and the folks who buy my tours and services. You can browse all of that at Annie's Boutique. Join us in France.com forward slash boutique. And if you'd like to see the photos of the things and places uh, we're discussing today, follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see all of those nice photos. And I will post them this week. Bonjour Elise. Bonjour Annie. Today we're going to talk about uh, Gallo-Roman sites uh, in France. And what does Gallo-Roman mean anyway? And what does Gallo-Roman mean anyway? Right. Yeah. And yeah. and the sites we've seen that we've enjoyed, because as you tour France, I'm sure you've seen places where it told you, oh, there's some Roman ruins right. exactly. here. Exactly. And so we'll talk about the ones that we think are really worth stopping at. Um, yeah, that's that's the plan for today's episode. Uh, that's the plan for today's episode, and um, and it's the the everybody out there is going oh, well, Roman ruins, Gallo Roman. What's the difference, really? You know, mm. well, that's what we're going to talk about too. Because if you look on internet or if you go on to different sites for things to see, most people, of course, think of Roman ruins. And since the Romans pretty much went everywhere around the Mediterranean, well, you know, you have big choice. It doesn't really matter which country you go to. But what we have here in France is a big chunk of the country that has what are officially designated as Gallo-Roman runes. And what we're going to do is talk about the difference between the two. Okay. So what places will we talk about? Well, for the most part, with the exception of a few things that you can see in Paris, like the Baths of Cluny, uh, which are, of course, attached to what is now a medieval um, museum, uh, most of the sites are in the southern half of f what is now called France. Right. And uh, part of that, um, I'll talk a little bit about why that is, but uh, there are things, of course, in England, there are things, there are places that you can actually visit in, in parts of Germany and, and in Belgium, but they are considered to be really not Gallo-Roman. And so what's the difference? After all, a stone is a stone, a temple is right. a temple, you know, mm -hmm, yeah, you know really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's really interesting that in France, as far as I know, a lot of these things are gathered around what we'd call today the Provence area. Yes. So, yeah. you know, it, there's a bunch of them, uh, Arles, Nîmes, which are typical, I mean, if you want to be exact, they are not in Provence. They are in Occitanie. They are in Occitanie. Today. Yes. Today. Yes. But they're actually, no, you, you, that's right. I, I'll have to correct you. It, they're not just in, they're not in Provence. They're in the south of France, which right. means they are largely in, and at the beginning, mostly in what is now Occitanie. 
yeah. which is really a silly thing because it starts uh, west of Toulouse and goes all the way to the Mediterranean and then up practically to Lyon. So it doesn't make any sense. It's like, what the hell is that? Yeah, you know? the right. names are... But, it in- but that is where it actually all began. Then... Uh, it includes, of course, Provence, which is to the east in the south. Right. And then Aquitaine, which right. is to the west uh, right. in the south. And basically, it stops at the Loire Valley. Okay. And okay. it really stops at the Loire Valley with a few m- exceptions, with just a few exceptions. Right. Okay? right. Um, but part of the reason for that is because when the Romans came, uh, when, they, when they started to move westward, uh, they moved westward along the Mediterranean. So that kind of makes sense if you think about it. And they took up uh, different positions along the coast, including further south, of course, in what is now Spain. But uh, talking about different places, uh, we, we, could, we can mention, of course, the Cluny Baths, which is one of my favorite things to see in Paris. Mm-hmm. And uh, which uh, I haven't, you've been back. I, I haven't been back since they redid... Uh, the museum. So I don't know what the entrance is like at this point. I haven't seen it finished. When I last time I went, it was it was still in construction, and I think it's completely closed right now. Oh, is it completely closed? Uh, I think it is for yeah. another f- maybe year, possibly. Maybe. So so yeah, they. Uh, well, you know, uh, with the COVID, everything slowed down. So whatever oh, work this was is reconstruction. Reconstruction yeah. probably got slowed down more by right. by whatever. But yes, it, it it is a major site, and of course that's because. Everyone knows, of course, that Paris was called Lutes under the Romans, right, when they finally got there. Uh, but it's pretty much the furthest north we're going to go in terms of talking okay. about any of these things. Yep. Okay. Then, if you really want to start, you start at Lyon. Okay. You can go a little bit further north, but basically there are major things to see on the hills because Lyon has two parts to it. There's a part that's down below by the rivers, and then there's a part called the Four Vievre. Uh, which is up above, and that's where there are the the runes uh, that include a, now a museum. And one of the things that's interesting is that in the last 10, 15 years, several of these cities that have major runes have opened museums. Mm. So uh, if, if you're interested in antiquity, which is really what we're talking about, right? Uh, this is really pre-Christian uh, development of what became France, uh, many of these places are really fun because they've been doing so much digging and discovering in the last 20, 25 years that there's a lot more to see and a lot more information about all these places. So you have Lyon, which has a bunch of things to see. And just south of Lyon is a small city called Vienne, Mm. which, uh, like the city in Austria, Vienna, uh, that is, uh, it has some major ruins to visit and uh, very interesting things to see, including a temple. Uh, So we're going down the road that the Romans built that basically led all the way up into Germany. Um, This is the big Domitia, the Via Domitia, which went all the way uh, along the the eastern, pretty much the eastern border of France. Uh, This is not necessarily in chronological order, but this is the way you go. Uh, Then you get to, uh, in not necessarily the exact order in terms of geography, uh, you get to a very wonderful place called Mm Vaison-la-Romaine, which I have visited several times, which is a small town uh, where uh, they discovered in the beginning of the 20th century in massive ruins of everything, absolutely everything. So mm-hmm. you have everything you imagine associated with, uh, with you know, a circus, temple, uh, theater, streets, houses, of course, in ruin, uh, vestiges, right. but with pieces of mosaics. And then you have Orange, right, which is wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and then a little bit later... I and don't. they have a lot of ruins, right? Well, they don't have a lot, but what they have is intact. Ah. And and that is what makes it so special. And of course, what uh, what you have in Orange, which is fabulous. And I was there just is it during or before COVID? I can't even remember now. We stopped there for a day. Uh, is a theater, a Roman Roman theater. But of course, we're still in this area that's called Gallo Roman, that is still used as a theater, and uh, it holds ten thousand people. Right. And uh, when, you, when you see it, because you, when there are no performances, you can visit it like you visit a, a, any site or museum. Um, the, 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 the stage 
is set up, uh, it really still looks like a stage, you know, I mean, right. w- w- with all these things. And it has perfect acoustics, mm. except, of course, now you have airplanes flying overhead. So I don't know how they deal with that when they're doing performances. <laughs> but it's it's really quite amazing because it's totally intact and it's one of the most uh, well-preserved anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And they have an Arc de Triomphe. Mm. And then they have a few other vestiges, but mostly it's the it's the theater, it's that, the theater. That, that's yeah. really a big draw there. Right. Uh, and then as you go further south, you get to a site called Glanum, which is what well, is now Saint Remy de Provence. Right. Which is largely, uh, as you say, ruins and vestiges of a, yeah, of a I, city. I've been to that one, and I I mean it was okay. I didn't. I wasn't awed by it. Let's put it that way. Well, a lot of these places are vestiges. Yeah. So you kind of have to use your imagination. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, they have signs that says this is where this was. But if you've been, like, I've been to Pompeii and uh, I kind of, and I like this stuff. I really like yeah. antiquity. So it's kind of fun because it leads you to imagine if, you know, what it was like, if it was, it was whole, you know, if you can see what it was like. And of course the Romans did an enormous amount of building right. everywhere. That was their thing. They were just builders, 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 you know. So you have Glanum and then of course you get to Arles. And Arles of course has its arena. Uh, it has uh, vestiges pretty much everywhere. Right. It's, Arles is probably the city that has the most. I think Arles and Nîmes. Right, Nîmes also, uh, Arles yes. and Nîmes. Uh, and of Nîmes course... has this beautiful Maison Carré. Yes, and it, it was a, it was a temple that was devoted to Augustus and his wife, Livia. So that's interesting because it was not devoted to gods. Mm-hmm. I guess he was considered a demigod. Right, I don't right. know. They, they worshipped Rome and the emperors. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wouldn't mind having a temple named after me. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Um, I just wanted to mention, though, for Arles, they, they, they have opened a, an incredible uh, archaeology archaeological uh, museum recently and they've been doing a lot of exploring in the waters off of Arles because we're right near the Camargue and of course it's right near the sea and uh, they've discovered lots of things in the in the waters and what they now have <clears throat> in the museum is the oldest and considered to be the most accurate bust of Julius Caesar mm. That was taken out of a ship, and for how they dated it, I'm not sure because it's made out of stone. Uh, maybe because of the things that were with it on on the on the ship or whatever, but that sunk because there was lots of uh, amphora mm-hmm. with wine and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, but it's now in this museum, so you can see the ship that was made of wood uh, and this incredible bust of Julius Caesar, and uh, and of course Arles Arena is famous for having. What I guess could be considered to be the the vestiges of the gladiator fighting, it's not my thing, and I'm actually opposed to it, but they have, of course, uh, Toromaki there. You know? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They have bullfighting there. Yeah, they do it's that. It's really not Still, my thing. I don't yeah. like it very much, but whatever. And then, of course, if we go a little bit west, we get to Nîmes. Right. And Nîmes um, has the most well-preserved temple, this famous temple that's now called the Maison Carré, which is plus an Arc de Triomphe, Plus vestiges in a garden, plus pieces of street of the of the Roman roads and everything. So it's really got a lot of things. And the and the uh, arena or Colosseum, if you want, in in Nîmes, is used all the time as well. Right. Like the one right, in Orange. Right, right, right. Uh, the the three that have and arenas. Not far, not far. Yeah, the Pont du Gard and the Pont des Gars and the, <laughs> the three arenas theaters. I, you know, I'm, there's a slight difference in structure, but you have Orange, Al, and Nîmes, which are really more or less in the same large area. Right. That all have these these massive structures, and then the Pont des Gars, and what's left of it actually is 52 kilometers, which I hadn't realized, uh, which is fairly long. Right, right. Just... Uh, it was over 500 kilometers long. Right. And it's three levels of arches, and this was one of the incredible aqueducts. Right, so they have aqueducts like that all over Europe, but right. that one is impressive because it's got three levels. Exactly. Uh, in, that, in that spot. Right. So the aqueduct is very long. Yes. But, but in that spot, uh, to go through that valley, they built that beautiful With three levels aqueduct. of arches. It's absolutely right. incredible right. looking. You know, there's, um, there's a big one also uh, near Lyon. Yes, um, but it's not as high. It's not as high. So it's not as impressive. And, and those are really the only two that 
<clears throat> where you can really see the that it's still functioning as it you can see that it was an aqueduct in the sense yeah. that it's not just rubble you know on on the ground yeah and then you get to Narbonne and but Narbonne doesn't have very much left it does have actually it? it's just that it's scattered Narbonne oh. Narbonne and Lyon were the two most important cities during the uh, Antiquity during the Gallo-Roman times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Narbonne was the capital of the province of the Narbonnese, and then Lyon, as they went further north, became uh, the name of Lyon in in Roman times was Lugudunum, and that became the the capital, capital, capital. This is where the emperors actually had uh, uh, palace and villas, but the Narbonne. Was, was actually the most important city for trade because it's right on the water. And it was the head of this entire thing. So it, it doesn't have... Uh, it, what you see is not as spectacular, but the problem is it's because a lot of the things are scattered. So right now, they've just two years ago opened up a brand new museum mm. uh, where they have brought all of the pieces that they have found in all of these different digs that are in and out all over the city. right. And there's a section of the major Roman road right next to the cathedral in, in the medieval section of right, Narbonne. Right, right. Uh, so but it's very small. I mean, it's fine. But it's it, fine. It's but interesting to see. And you're like, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to ride my car on this thing or, or a horse oh, or anything. Yeah. <laughs> but, but actually, it gives you an idea. You know, we have the same stretch of road in Toulouse, but it's actually, and it is visitable, believe it or not, but it's inside the enormous courthouse, the right. brand courthouse. Right. So it's only open on a few weekends a, uh, a month, and but it is exactly the same. And there's another piece of it, actually. There's two pieces of it in Toulouse. The thing about Toulouse, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the thing about Toulouse is that, again, a little bit like Narbonne, but even more so, there is a lot of stuff to see, but it's not out in the open. Mm. So you have to know when you can go to see it. That that's right, the right, biggest right. problem. But right. from Narbonne, of course, they went south eventually to what is now Spain. But then, of course, they went west. And the next most important city was Toulouse. Right. In between, of course, they had some settlements. There's actually some Roman ruins inside the Count's Castle in Carcassonne, up in the old city, which I have actually had the privilege of seeing. Right, there's some. But it's not available to the general public. You have to have a special privilege to be able to go in and see it. But right. that was actually a Roman settlement before it became a medieval settlement. And so there's a Roman bridge in Carcassonne, but it's not the, major. The Roman bridges are everywhere. Everywhere, yes. Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, the, the, it's, it's actually now considered to be like a form of bridge, if you want to call it that. Right. And then you, so when you get to the next major stop, which is Toulouse, which was Toulouse in, in, antique, in antiquity, and Toulouse was an extremely important city in the Roman times. And Toulouse had absolutely everything that you have in Nîmes and in Arles. Except we don't have it anymore. Except we, they don't <laughs> have it anymore. But what we do have is one of the best archaeology museums in France. Mm. And it really is. And it, one of the reasons why is because most of the ar archaeological digging has been done in the region around Toulouse as opposed to inside the city. So Toulouse actually has uh, an arena that you can visit, which is in Pourpont, which is a section oh, of Toulouse. Oh, but there's nothing there. It's just, it's just grass. No, it's it's a structure. It's a, right, okay. It's a structure. It's but, a circular stru structure. Right, but that's what arenas are. Yeah, but it's... it's I but, mean, like, okay, if you're going to tell people about stuff, it has to be interesting. There's nothing there. The, 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 you walk your dog there. It's great to walk your dog. No, I, I don't agree with you. I think... <laughs> I don't agree with you. I think that a lot of these places, except for a few of the temples and the, the uh, uh, coliseums, Nothing is is anything but a ruin in most of these places. So if you accumulate the different no, places... But, okay, but if you go to la, Les Arènes de Lutèce, you see stone, you see the, 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 where the stage was, you understand very well. In Toulouse, it's just a circular it's made of hill, a little bit of brick left, but it's mostly grass. No, there are three entranceways with arches and everything. There are. It's just not complete... Yeah, but it's underwhelming. I mean, I've been a few times. In Toulouse, uh, you can see, uh, if you go into uh, several structures and then you go to the, the archaeological museum, which is called San Ramon, you really get a very good idea of what 
it was like, obviously, most of it has been covered up. And that, unfortunately, is part of the politics of the individual cities, because when I first arrived in Toulouse, there was much more visible. And so in 23 years, what the city has chosen to do is actually cover it up. Now, don't even ask me why, but that, I think, is Mm -hmm, kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. politics to have when it comes to understanding the history of a region. But Toulouse was, of course, a major, major important city, and it had everything. It did have everything that all these other cities have. And then you travel going west, but mostly northwest, because it followed the Garonne River going up towards Bordeaux, and you actually get to the city of Cahors. Mm. And Cahors has, of course, a very small section that has Roman ruins. It's a very small town anyway. It's only 25,000 people. But it does have an old uh, city center that has Roman ruins, and it has a fountain devoted to one of the goddesses that the Romans had. And so it's mixed in, of course, with the medieval. And sometimes it's very difficult to understand which is Roman and which is medieval in cases like that. But they really built as they went along the way. And then, of course, you move on to Perigueux, uh, where you have the site, the site of Vesuna, which, which you visited. Which is really impressive. Really, really impressive. And in between, in the areas uh, uh, west and uh, of Toulouse and basically south of Caor, you have a region that had what were called the villas. And a villa in ancient Roman times was a plantation. And so these were places that were the equivalent of a thousand acres, places mm-hmm. that were really huge. They had slaves. It was a a huge agricultural enterprise. And these are the places that have the best preserved ruins, including mosaics, uh, the thermal system, the the caustic system that they had for, they had heated water running in and out of the houses. They had baths and everything. And there are two that are west of Toulouse, that I have visited. One is called Saviac, which has some of the best mo- mosaics left anywhere in all of France. And the other, which has just reopened, they've just uh, done a, a whole lot of work on it to reopen it, is called Montmorin. And both of them are very good for giving you an idea of what life was like, not in the city centers uh, at that time, but most of these places that were large agricultural exploitation places. And these two villas are considered to be the best left in France. Mm. And then you get eventually up to... Because I remember going to Montmorin when I was a kid, but I... No, 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 uh, it's nothing like that now. a long time ago. No, and it's really well documented. And Mm -hmm. so you really get to see what it was like. And they give you a circuit to follow so that you see see where the slaves were housed. You see the different rooms of the house. You see the pieces of mosaic. You see a lot of that stuff. And it's really kind of interesting to imagine what life was like in in those times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the vestiges of these villas are what you find in the archaeology museums. And then you eventually get, of course, to Bordeaux, which was Berdigala under the Romans. And uh, there's an Arc de Triomphe, and there's a couple of columns and a few pieces like that. And then you can go all the way up to Saintes, which was a Roman city. called The the peoples that were living there were called the Saintonge, which is where the city actually got its name from. And then eventually it sort of dissipates as you head towards the Loire River. You're further north, so we've yeah. really made a circuit uh, really coming down on the eastern side, hooking around all the way across the south and all the way back up. Yeah, the only one that I know of that you didn't mention is uh, La Turbie, which is right on the border between Italy and Spain. It's right. near Es. It's near Es. And that's... Right. Uh, it's a... Uh, Big construction to the glory of one of the emperors. Right. Well, there are other things. It? There are other oh, the places. Trophy, the, the, the trophy of August right. there, is there, what it is. There but are, it's impressive looking. It's, it's impressive looking. And yeah. there, were, there are, of course, the Roman ruins up on the hill in Nice, which is the Simiez yes, hill, right? Yes, yes, uh, But there are lots of little things in other places. For instance, oh, I didn't everywhere. know there was a temple. There's a temple. There are vestiges of a temple dev- devoted to Mercury in uh, Clément Ferrand. Which, right. is, which is in the center of the Massif Central, uh, the, right in the middle of the volcanic area. And it turns out, which is the part I think is fun, and this is when we can sort of segue into the whole idea of what is Gallo-Roman, right. that the temple was a temple devoted to a Celtic god named Lug. Lug? L-U-G, Lug, 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 I don't know, Lug, Lug. When the region got taken over by the Romans, and basically everybody kind of, went, okay, we're going to start living the Roman life, it got converted into a temple devoted to Mercury. 
Mm. So they basically took the same structure, they embellished it, they mm. made it a little bit bigger because the Celts did not have arch arches. You know, the Celts were uh, a people that had built many structures made out of stone, particularly for their gods. But like the Greeks, they had not invented the arch. Uh, they had lintels, you know, the horizontal piece, and they had peaked roofs, but the, it was the Romans that introduced the arch in construction. Mm. Right? So uh, the fact is that if you really want to, you can spend weeks going in and out of little villages and places everywhere in France, particularly oh, yeah. the southern half, and find some kind of vestige from right. these times. But the biggies are the Pont du Gard, Nîmes, Arles, Périgueux. La Turbie, I would, I would argue, because it's big. It's, like, impressive. saint de provence is also major. Orange is major. Uh, and then in Paris, Cluny and... And the, and the, yeah, and the, the villas. And the villas. Because if you go to Narbonne or to Toulouse or to Bordeaux, you will see small things. You will see small things. Small, scattered things, but which is really not uh, fascinating. I mean, I'm sorry to be a downer, but, you know, people only have... So long, so much. Yeah, time. but I, I really don't they agree can't. with you, Annie. And I think that, for instance, since I've done guiding in the museum here, the San Remo Museum, many times, I, it's really, really interesting to see if you if you don't have to just it, imagine that the only thing to do is go out to a site outside. If you go, for instance, to the San Remo Museum here, you have everything that shows you what life was like in those times, including right. pieces. And it of, is interesting. It is interesting. You have objects from inside the houses. You have pieces of mosaic. You have models that show you what life was like in both the cities and in the things. And I think that some of, because a lot of the sites, except for the few pieces, the, I mean, you're talking about the pieces that are the most uh, impressive by size, you know, but yes. to me, that's not what's most interesting. It's really not. The arenas, except for the fact that I enjoyed the, the theater in Orange because I was there when they were setting up scenery for a performance and you could see how they can mix the real stone with the fake stone, you know, and pieces like that. Uh -huh. To me, I mean, I've been to Rome and I've been to other places that have arenas and things like that. So it's, it's really, they're fun to see. But to me, what's really interesting is to see what life was like uh, at that time. And to do that, You have to go to places that have more vestiges and to the museums. And museums, yes. And the museums. Yes, so. and, and it's true that saint Raymond is good and Vesuna is excellent. And Vesuna is, is excellent. excellent. Right. So. so let's talk a little bit why it's called Gallo-Roman. Yes. Okay. So everybody knows that the Romans pretty much went everywhere around the Mediterranean. Um, some people are much more fascinated by, by Romans. And of course, as far as I understand, they went two-thirds of the way up England and then were stopped by the the wild Scots or the, whatever the Picts or whoever the group was that was up there. And the, the Romans kind of went, okay, we've had enough. Let's just turn around and go back down south. We don't need these <laughs> weird ones up here, you know. Uh, but in fact, uh, Western Europe had been inhabited by... Uh, groups of uh, of what is, I guess we could call a people, I don't even know what the right word is, a civilization, I'm not really sure exactly what the right word is, that are what we now call the Celts. Right. And they, uh, th they've they been traced back to basically the steppes and like Eastern Turkey, Anatolia, and, and, and Eastern Europe. They were, they were groups of peoples, which w they formed a civilization, but apparently... Um, there were differences in dialects among some of the different groups. They, were, I guess, were in tribes. But little by little, over a period that really was very long, I didn't under, I didn't really know this. It took them probably more than 600 years to slowly move west into Western Europe, and and they inhabited Western Europe uh, at least 500, 600 BC. Right, this is pre-Roman times. This is well, well, well uh, before the Romans. Right. And in fact, now, I don't know how they do this. It's this kind of stuff, I, I have no idea how they come up with these numbers. The estimate is that before the Romans actually conquered all of Western Europe, Western Europe was had approximately 10 million people. Mm. Which, uh, considering that, that we imagine it being vast forests and hills and not much of anything else, um, it, it kind of belies whatever that was. And it turns out that uh, the Celts, who had uh, distributed their population over what is now France and Belgium and 
parts of Germany and uh, and the southern British Isles, um, and even into uh, northern Spain. That's the Iberians. That's the the group that was actually there. They were united by customs and religion, even though they had developed somewhat different dialects. But by the time you get to the period of the Romans, which is really a little less than 200 B.C., they had established cities, which nobody really talks about. You know, we read asterisks, which is very funny, because <laughs> you see them with their long beards and their big bushy mustaches and their wild hair and these silly helmets on their heads and their magic potions and everything like that. Well, it is true that the Romans called them the hairy ones, you know, because <laughs> they did not shave and they did not necessarily cut their hair, uh, and that was apparently part of their customs. But it turns out that they actually did have towns... Mm -hmm. They had a uh, very, very well-developed agriculture. They did have roads. They weren't as well-developed and sophisticated as the Romans had. Their houses were made mostly of wood and thatched roofs, but their temples were made of stone. And they had well-organized systems of agriculture with patches of land devoted to people. Yeah. And, and their religion was, of course, what the now uh, mostly people like to call the Druid religion. Nobody, I think, really knows exactly what, they, what it was. But they had an extremely well-developed and, and uh, relatively sophisticated society. Yeah, near Toulouse, we have this thing called the Village Gaulois. Yes, exactly. And they, they, they're kind of recreating a... Gaul village exactly, and they they are doing it uh, the way with the tools of the time exactly exactly. And so you can see the pottery, you can see the coins, you can see. I can't remember what yeah, all. Well, I've well, been a couple of times, but the, it's been it's a long funny time. because what of course the what they were famous for was their metalwork. They were do, yeah. very good at doing and and uh, woodwork. Yeah, uh, and uh, yes, at the Archeo seat in it's Rio Volvestre, which is just yeah. you know, south south of Toulouse, they're they're really doing that. So this and it's fun to go there with kids. It's actually. very fun. Yeah, it's, it's really a lot I of think fun. It's, yeah. it's I think it's interesting with yeah. kids especially. And so you know they were actually a far more sophisticated people than 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 you can imagine. And it turns out that over the course of a couple of hundred years, maybe even more than that, they were doing trade with Roman merchants, who of course were all over the place, and even. With with Greek merchants, because Marseille was originally a Greek colony, and it was mostly a commercial colony. And so you have objects coming from, in, from Rome and objects coming from whatever Greek colonies existed that, that are, have been found as far west as the Atlantic Ocean, and vice versa. There was trade back and forth. So the, the, there was contact between all these peoples. It just so happens that uh, they were not united. That is, there was no central administration like you have in Rome. And of course, Rome first was a republic and then an empire. But under both of them, it was extremely well organized in terms of its administration. Right. And there was a central administration and central rulers. And the problem that happened with the Celts, or the Gauls, as they were called by the Romans, was that each area wa was led by a particular leader, and they didn't necessarily join together to create any kind of centralized government or administration. Right. And what happened was that when the Romans finally moved west and started conquering, which really is what they did, you know, the, all of what now becomes Western, you know, France and Germany and then eventually parts of England and Spain, they fought with the peoples that were in each of these regions, but because they did not unite, they lost, that's really what happened. In fact, I didn't know. I was reading a, something the other day that Julius Caesar had written, and of course, they, he he documented pretty much everything he did, just like all of the, the leaders. He was the head of the legions that moved west. He actually wrote and said, it's a good thing they're not united because we would have lost the battles. <laughs> and so, you know, it's typical because later on in the Middle Ages, it's exactly the same thing that happened between the South when it was really a separate kingdom under the Counts of Toulouse and the North. They lost because they weren't united. Right. So there's a kind of spirit in the South of what is now France that I guess never has gone away when it comes to things like that. So eventually you get to pretty much 100 B.C., and the Romans are slowly moving in, and they start having fights with the different groups of Celts that are in the different areas. And the major battles first were up and around Lyon. Mm. But they quickly, the Romans quickly took over. Mm. And that's when they made what became Lyon their capital. 
they had a harder time with the groups that were down in what is now Occitania. And uh, you have the different tribes in Occitania that resisted far longer. And ironically, they resisted far longer, but they were the ones that had had the most contact with the Romans until you get to this fatal battle in 52 BC, mm -hmm. which took place in Alicia, which is in the Massif Central, uh, which is in the center, north center, like in the, in the Aveyron area. Is there a town there now? There's a site. Mm. There's actually a, just a site that commemorates this famous battle. Okay. Uh, apparently, there was a lot of discussion about exactly where the battle took place. You know, right. so so they put a, a, a some kind of a you know a, a stele, some kind of a marker, and some place, and they said this is where the battle was. You know, it could have been a little bit to the left. It could have been a little bit right. to kil some kilometer to the right. And what happened there, of course, was that in spite of the fact that there was a very long, drawn out battle with the different Celtic groups that were in the south. They, the Celtic groups lost. And it's from 50 BC on that all of what is now the southwest of France officially came under the rule of Roman law. Mm. And it was... What they did, though, is what makes it so interesting, is that without too much resistance, once the Romans had won... Uh, the different peoples that were living in what is now really the south and the southwest of France just kind of said, okay, I guess this is what we have to do. So what they started to do was they accepted Roman law and they accepted some of the Roman customs, which included changing a lot of the names and Latinized a lot of the names, although what the Romans did, which was very clever, and I think it's really, if you're going to conquer a people, you might as well do it that way, uh, aside from the fact that obviously there were battles and <laughs> people killed, is they allowed all of their legions to intermarry with the local population. Uh -huh. And they uh, kept a lot of name places that were Celtic name places so that the people didn't feel like they were totally displaced out of the places that they actually came from. Right. And, and what happened was that they took on some of the technology that the, that the Celtic tribes had developed as I mentioned, the, the Celts were the first ones to make wooden barrels, for instance, for wine. They were making mead and they were making other alkali, alcohol, alkalized drinks. Alcoholic drinks? Alcoholic, you mean? well, al yeah, alcoholic, a drink, alcohol. Drinks that, drinks that have alcohol. Right. right. Yeah. That, you know, uh, I guess a drink doesn't become an alcoholic, but whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and then the Romans, um, so the Romans brought brick making technique and all kinds of other building techniques that the Celts had not had. And the reason why it became known as Gaul is because the original tribes that came from the far eastern part of Europe had their name that began with the letters G-A-L. And the Romans, basically continuing that tradition, designated this area as Gaul. That's okay. really, but it's really the Celts. I mean, this is just different Celtic groups. The, the, the Celts that went further north were pretty much ignored by the Romans for a very long time. And what's interesting then is that what happened is that it's the southern half of France that turned into a new civilization by combining the customs, the laws, the tastes, the foods, the names uh, that were both Celtic and Roman, so that in the north, if you go, for instance, to Germany or further north, wherever the Romans went, it is not considered to be Gallo-Roman. It's really specific to south of the Loire Valley, most mm. of that. And, and, and it really was a hybrid civilization that developed and to this day, that's really what it was. They kept a lot of the name places. Um, they kept a lot of the uh, the customs. Uh, the the Celtic yeah. gods got more or less converted over to Roman gods, but they kept the customs that they had before. And the Romans were very clever until they started having the invasions in the 300s, in 300 ADs, when, of course, they started uh, tightening up, tightening the screws, if you wish, is that they allowed the people in this part of, of, the, of France to keep their old customs and traditions, and so it was relatively easy for them to survive. Mm -hmm. And that is why the buildings and the structures that the Romans helped add to what was going on, and of course they modernized, and if you can imagine, and they modernized everything. They built these aqueducts, they built these 
much more sophisticated roads. They built the arenas and they built the theaters and they built the coliseums and the temples and everything else. The reason why most of these things are still standing in the South as opposed to the North is because they, the people in the South were loyal to the Roman Empire much longer. Mm-hmm. And because north of the Loire Valley, you have the Germanic tribes, the Franks, who came in, who hated the Romans, who fought against the Romans, and they are the ones who took over basically the northern part, including parts of Germany and Belgium. And that is why you have the language of Occitan, which is more Latinized, and the original French language, which was the language of the Franks, which was more Germanic in, in the north. Mm-hmm. So that is why almost all the places we've mentioned are in the southern half of, of France. Right, because that's by definition. By definition. That's where right. it was. And just to mention, just to understand, if you go to one of the archaeology museums, and the, since the one I really know the best is San Ramon here in Toulouse, a section of the museum, not a big part of it, but a small section that's very interesting, is devoted to pre-Roman times. And one of the things you see is what the structure of the houses were, but also the, the work they did in metal and the work they did with gold. And, one, of course, one of the, the myths or one of the stories that comes out of uh, the Celtic times is that they venerated gold and they thought it had magic powers. And so it was the warriors. It wasn't the women who wore gold as, as ornamentation. It was the men who wore these impe- incredible pieces on their wrists and their ankles and around their necks to go into battle because they thought that the gold gave them a magic power and obviously they must have had some kind of connection to a sun god or something like that. And they have uncovered a lot of these pieces in the region around Toulouse and you can see them in the museum and they're quite amazing to see. I mean, mm-hmm. when you think of what go- pure gold is, uh, the value of pure gold, which of course for the Romans was really much more ornamentation. They, uh, they probably thought that the that the Celts were a little bit crazy, but maybe they weren't. <laughs> maybe really well, they weren't. You know? Well, gold isn't, I mean, it's a soft metal. It's a soft metal. Yeah. So really, I mean, yeah. it wasn't I, the best idea. I, I mean, if it was magical, that's the different yeah, well, thing. Well, it's different. I mean, it's like the magic potion in Asterix. Right, you know? right, I right. Mean, th- there's something magical about it, you know. But but it's really interesting to see uh, that this is what happened in the south of what is now France. And then the Iberes, or the Iberes, uh, were uh, one of the Celtic tribes that moved across the Pyrenees into Spain and they are the ones who eventually settled and Romanized the area there. By the way, in Arles right now, there is a brand new museum called the Museum of Romanization. Mm-hmm. And it's a museum that just opened up a couple of years ago and has uh, a lot of the pieces that they have found in doing all of the digging around Arles because a lot of it is is new stuff that they have found all the time. So what they're discovering, I think, is that uh, the Roman influence was enormous, even more than they thought. Right. You know, and, and, it, and it wasn't always, uh, what's the word I want? Like, it's not like they fought, fought, fought. Right. Very often the Romans just integrated into the local society and they brought so much well-being because, well, you know, I mean, having fresh water nearby oh, absolutely. is a lot of well-being. And um, they built, they, they brought buildings and impressive buildings. That's one of the reasons why, to me, seeing the impressive stuff the big is stuff. important. Because I think for regular people like me who are not specialists, I just, I'm like, wow. It's the wow factor. It's the wow factor. That's important. Yeah. And that's why the Pont du Gard is probably the one place that where I like recommend yeah. everybody goes um, because it's just like, wow. Mm-hmm. I guess <laughs> and, if, if it, it, and with kids, it's mm-hmm. impressive because you can see how they brought water. There's a little museum there right. too that explains how moving water around and bringing it to the cities was really important and why. Uh, because in the southeast of France, especially, they don't have that much rain. I mean, you can't rely on cisterns and things no. like that, no. not year-round. Um, maybe in the southwest a little more, we have more rainfall. Maybe. maybe. In the north of France, they definitely they have, more, have more. more rainfall. So, so just having the water 
was huge. But I think it's also because in Rome, I mean, Rome had running water. The Roman civilization, oh, baths were extremely important. I yeah. mean, people went to the public baths all the time. Right. It was considered to be part of what you did in your life was to cleanse yourself. Right. You know? And that's why. But you know, as a here. French kid, when you grow up reading Asterix, uh, as I did, you kind of get the impression that we didn't, we don't like the Romans. We we just don't. We're against them. We fight them. We mm. we you know we punch them in the face constantly in the book, in the comics. But but the reality was quite different. Well, I think. I mean, there were people who fought. There obviously. were a lot of there were a lot of very there bad lot, battles. Yeah, there were a lot of very bad battles. But there was also a lot of getting along. I, I guess. think that the getting along came afterwards because what I was reading yesterday was that even around Lyon. It took a while, and it took some major killing uh, for the the people that were here before the Romans to really calm down and, and accept. I think yeah. what happened was that the Romans were very clever in the sense that once they had gotten past the battle, they basically made it easy for everybody to just adapt to life under them. I mean, basically, I think that's what, what you're saying. Right, yes. And, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that, you know, there's this real emphasis that the Romans had, which is, of course, a, a very modern concept. It's still a concept that we use today, which is the idea of a centralized administration with laws and customs that everybody right. pays attention to. And writing. And writing. Yeah, and, they, they and, had and, laws and, in writing. And, and, and so writing. They were very uh, yeah. literate pe people in that right. sense, you know. So... Yeah, they brought a lot of that. They brought a lot of sophistication in that sense to what were basically um, and wine and wine and wine and wine and olive oil. Well, you we know, it's them. interesting. They say <laughs> that the the Celts had their own version of wine. I think it was probably more like a beer. My, my, my guess is probably more like a beer. Yeah. But but it's interesting that the, the 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 they they made life public. They made it so that you have rules and regulations, and then there was a public life. And you you shared things, and I think that's right. part of the. We have that heritage t to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I find really impressive, and maybe because it, if, if you talk about even life in the Middle Ages, and you talk about life in Europe in general, everything goes back to the Romans. Yeah, just about everything. I mean, it, it's just amazing the influence that is so lasting after two thousand years of what the Romans brought to the Western world. Right. Really. And even if you look at, I mean, this is a, a gross oversimplification, I'm sure. But uh, I think of the the medieval order where you have the Lord protecting the people. Right. Well, that's more like a mafia. <laughs> it's more like, a, you know, a top-down right. mafia. Uh, so even that is something that, I mean... Maybe it wasn't Roman. Maybe the Romans didn't have mafias. No, I, I don't. I don't do think now. they did. But yeah. I mean, the, the well, the, I mean, the Roman times really lasted six hundred years, which yeah. is a long time. And the first part was a republic, which was very much, you know, everybody voted on everything. Everybody, excuse me, landed men. I mean, right, you know, right, right, only, right. only certain people, not not slaves, you know, just certain categories of men. But but um, then you get into the empire. But we're still, you know, Julius Caesar is the transition from from republic to to empire. Uh, but they designated rulers as administrators of different regions because the empire was so big. I mean, yeah. you know, and and. And they had charters of rules and regulations. There were charters for rules and regulations about commerce. There were charters of rules and regulations for everything. And and, and I think our concept of 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 what a, a government or state should be really comes from comes that. from that. Yeah, you know when you think yeah. about it. And yeah. you're right. I mean, it wasn't just you know one body, one person sort of making the law. I I'm sure they must have had some corruption. They probably of did. Course, you know, of course. Um, I think the people that were found to be corrupt were pretty much gotten rid of very quickly. Mm. You know, anyway, you know, they were good at poisoning people. I think you know. So <laughs> especially the higher up you go, the more you get to be poisoned. I think you know that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, but but it it the the look. Here we are in the Southwest. You have uh, buildings made of the Colosseum, like the the aqueduct, the 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 the, the Colosseums and the arenas, like in Nîmes. Everything is made of these stones that are unbelievable, with these gorgeous pieces of you know massive stone. Here in Toulouse, 
we have things that are made of brick and stone. Who introduced the concept of brick making? It was the Romans. Yeah. You know, I mean, they taught it about tiles for the roofs. You know, it's, it's terracotta tile. Whoopee, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, it's still here. It's still yeah, here yeah. 2,000 years later. Yeah, right? still- so it's, it, it's just that what's interesting is that in the South, it was Gallo-Roman. That is that the Celts really made a difference, whereas in the North, for whatever reason, maybe because the Germanic peoples were very different from the Celts, I have no idea. Yeah. You know? um, the Romans, even the Roman vestiges, they're no longer there, and then pretty much there are teeny little things left. There's a little bit in Reims. You have mm. a gateway in Reims, you know, uh, proof that they were there. Right. That's they all, were there, yeah. you know, I mean, that's yeah. pretty much what you get, yeah. Yeah, even even everywhere. Interesting. But, well, but, and besides, if you're interested in uh, Gallo-Roman stuff, you'll be in the south of France, which is wonderful. Which is wonderful. So we're all for it. And, and, and it's just, and it's really, it's here. It's just here everywhere, mm-hmm. yeah, without Asterix. But Asterix is fun, too. Asterix is fun. <laughs> Have you been to the Asterix Park? Yes, I did. Yes, I haven't. <laughs> it's full of little jokes. So we haven't talked about it on the podcast because it's kind of, it's very French, very, very French. So everywhere you look, they have a few rides and stuff, but they have buildings that kind of look like what we think Asterix was like. Right. But they have really like, like dad jokes. Oh. Those sorts of jokes everywhere. It's they're scattered and they're all in French. They're all but are they written out or are the people They're written them? out. They're written so out. they have they have like signs everywhere that are just humoristic. Because they figured they wanted to entertain the parents while the kids were running around right. doing rides or whatever. And it, it's well done. It's it's a pleasant place. But I think if you don't speak French and if you don't understand French humor, it might be <laughs> kind of lost it's, on nothing's you. Nothing's translated? I don't remember anything translated. Oh. But I haven't been f- in several years. Uh, I think we went. Um, our daughter, Marianne, was probably 12 or 13, and she's okay. 23. So right, right, it's been a right, long time, right. you know. But it, it it was pleasant, just just full of jokes that, that made me groan. <laughs> <laughs> if if people go to the Provence area, uh, it, it's it's really interesting. If you have a chance, of course, you know, whatever you have to think about this ahead of time. But one of the most wonderful things you can do is either go to a performance at Orange, yeah. in, in the theater there, or go to something. Uh, We've had an episode about Orange, and and uh, go go to uh, one of the spectacles, one of the shows that they have in one of the arenas. It's just absolutely fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Nîmes really Nîmes has. Big names come. I mean, yeah. like massive uh, world stars come to perform in Nîmes. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's, for, it's and beautiful. And Orange has what they call the Koeji, which is, uh, the, you know, they have theater shows, they have opera, they have all of these things. You know, it, it, being inside one of them is really... No, it's not Orange we had an episode about. It was Avignon that we had Avignon. an episode about. Yes, right. We did Avignon. Yeah, we did Avignon. The, but, but it... I understand when you say that you what impresses you the most is the big massive structure. To me, it's the idea of sitting in one of those places and seeing a performance just like they did two thousand years ago. That's true. That's like that's Yeah, the, but they've added the, electricity and sound and lights and all of that so in the meantime. Ah <laughs> still a lovely, lovely experience. Well, I'd have to wear a toga maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. You're welcome, Addy. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I would like to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back, even though I don't have any new patrons to thank this week. I would love to get more. To check it out, go to patreon.com for a slash join us, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, join us, no spaces or dashes. I'd love nothing more than to have several new patrons to thank in the new year, so I hope you are in a generous mood. The new measures the Prime Minister is talking about is to stop allowing people to just get tested and get a temporary QR code because they feel that's letting people who don't go out very much get away with not being vaccinated. At first, a negative test gave you a pass sanitaire with a QR code, and that was good for three days. Then they shortened it to one day, and they want to change it so that the test no longer makes anyone eligible for a pass sanitaire. And as a matter of fact, they want to start calling it um, pass vaccinal instead of a pass sanitaire. 
They have also announced that they will go after medical professionals who deliver fake vaccine documentation because we've had several people who've died in hospitals recently because they lied about their vaccine status. The standard of care apparently is not the same if you've been vaccinated or if you haven't. And people who are sick enough to go to the hospital and then lie about having been vaccinated because they somehow bought a fake QR code somewhere, these people are taking their lives into their own hands and some of them lose. And so there are a few doctors, uh, not very many, and a few pharmacists. Uh, I've heard of a kinesitherapeute also who was doing this. Uh, that's a physical uh, therapist. They sell uh, QR codes. Uh, they deliver fake pass sanitaire in exchange, of course, for a few hundred euros. They're going to get visits from the gendarmes and deservedly so, in my opinion. And it does not take a lot of cheaters to create a big problem. But this is a big enough change that it's going to have to be discussed in Parliament in the new year. So, uh, and I really don't have any doubt that it'll get passed, but it will not affect visitors at all uh, because vi visitors have to be vaccinated. And I suppose there must be fake CDC cards going around, unfortunately. So who knows? I gotta say, despite uh, the, this uh, fifth wave and all of that stuff, uh, which is very sad and Uh, I'm pretty encouraged that the public discourse in France, I was at the hairdressers this morning, uh, and there was a vigorous discussion about how people who are not getting vaccinated are selfish and that they have no right to do that uh, because then there's people who get sick and the hospitals are full and it's it's a terrible situation. So, you know, I, th I think uh, there's going to be some pressure for people to get vaccinated even if it's, not, I mean, there will be obviously some from the government, but also some cultural culture at this point, I think. Not that I'm trying to tell you that travel to France is a great idea. Uh, if I hadn't booked my trip to the US uh, a few months ago, who knows if we would have gone ahead with it. Uh, but I'm really glad we're going anyway. We're needing to set our watches, uh, our alarms very early uh, tomorrow morning, but it's for a good cause. All right, the French expression of the week is avoir le cul brodé de nouille, or if you're in a hurry, the shorter version, avoir le cul brodé. Now, in French, we also say avoir du cul. Le cul, I'm sure you know, is the derrière, the behind. And if you have behind in France, avoir du cul, you are lucky. Apparently, long ago, they favored the expression « avoir le cul verni », which meant that your behind was varnished. And that was also very lucky. « Brodé » means « embroidered ». So, <laughs> si tu as le cul brodé, your behind is embroidered. And uh, if it's brodé de nouille, then it's embroidered with noodles. <laughs> So here we are. If your behind is embroidered with noodles, you are very lucky. <laughs> I don't know where we got that from. Um, nobody online could explain it to me in a way that made any sense to me either. But there's a less objectionable way to say the same thing if you do not wish to use the word cu, which is, after all, kind of... You know, I mean, it's not vulgar. Uh, this is a cute expression. You wouldn't use it when uh, giving a, a, a formal address to a group of people. But between friends, you would say it, and it's really not a shocking expression. But there is a less uh, objectionable way to say this. Uh, and it goes like this. Tu as du pot. You have pot. Because obviously, if you have a pot, you're doing well indeed, Cooks like me appreciate how distressing it is to lose a great pot to a cooking accident. In the new year, let us not take our pots for granted and let us be happy when our behinds are varnished or embroidered with noodles. It's all good. Just roll with it. <laughs> Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 370 where you can see a recap of what we've discussed as well as links to relevant resources. Next week on the podcast, a fun interview about a book that's about to come out 
The publisher sent me an advance copy and I read it and really enjoyed it. It's called The Paris Bookseller. I had a lovely chat with the author, Carrie Mayer, and I think you're going to like this book all about Shakespeare and Company and Sylvia Beach, the wonderful American Francophile who started the bookstore. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season and I will be back with uh, timely updates, uh, live updates next Sunday. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.